on this week's episode, Gamescom's early returns. Madden gets set to hit the field, and will DC return to the fandom? All this and more as we reach our next stop, the PCC Multiverse. Don't be alarmed. The quasi-shimmering light before you is a trans-dimensional gateway to other worlds, other voices, other thoughts, and other realities. Up feels like down, and down feels like the number seven on a Wednesday morning. Don't worry. That quivering, blood-boiling sensation under your eyebrows is all a part of the charm. Welcome to the PCC Multiverse. And we're back with another episode of the PCC Multiverse. Multiverse. This is Gerald Glassford from Pop Culture Cosmos, Game Source, Inside Sports Fantasy Football, and the Lakers Fast Break. We truly appreciate everyone out there listening to all of our shows, and if you can, please give us that five star review on Apple Podcasts. Truly appreciate it. Let's also as well if you can like, support, share, subscribe, whatever you can do to support us here at the Pop Culture Cosmos. Throw us some of those Facebook gaming stars at us. We just truly appreciate that as well. But it wouldn't be a PCC Multiverse without my good friend. He's our own new mutant of Pop Culture Cosmos. You got to check out what he's doing today at popculturecosmos.com. Plus also as well, his great shows, Pop Apocalypse, and of course, the Super BS Gamescast. And of course, his book as well, you got to get on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. Congratulations, you suck. How dare I forget that? It is my good friend. It is Josh Peterson. What's up, man? What's up? What's up? So, uh, yeah, I've been uh, got this superpower as a new mutant. I'm able to kind of dig into rumors and stuff. So, I mean, if you want to see my powers, just go ahead and ask, you know, whenever you're ready. Well, okay, I'm, I'm almost ready, my friend. But I wanted to ask you this. I know your new superpower for this time around is your superpower in the way you like to go ahead and tell us about those rumors. So I'm ready, my friend, to take another trip into the rumor bit with you right here at the Pop Culture Cosmos. So go ahead, my friend. But please, can we avoid another Mass Effect trilogy, please, at this point in time? All is quiet in the uh, galaxy far far away well that's star wars but you know the galaxy where the citadel and the reapers are all's quiet on that front instead we got more noise coming out of the uh dc universe so rumor has it uh this is by we got this com. usually very is somewhat reputable so as we all know the justice league part two got scrapped right because Justice League didn't perform as well as they thought and that kind of made them want to move their properties away from dcu continuity but because of all the hype surrounding the uh, the Snyder Cut of the Justice League, they're saying that if the Snyder Cut is successful, then they will, in fact, head back towards the DCU continuity and create a Justice League 2. So that means heroes like Shazam and Aquaman and Wonder Woman uh, will all come back and uh, you know, be, be rallied back into the DCU. And The Rock apparently is a really big proponent of the DCU because he wants Black Adam to fight Superman, uh, fight Henry Cavill's Superman. I guess they're great friends in real life. Well, I think so they're going the rumor... to do that in the Black Adam. Or at least they're going to tease it, per se, or at least have a small little fight. That's what's rumored to happen. Yes. Okay, all right. Well, there's, well I mean, because he's because Henry Cavill signed to appear in more than one DC film, but not star in it that makes sense does that make sense just like a peer so i got i have more on that though so according to this according to this article here by we got this covered if and it says so stack snyder's in early talks to put justice league 2 back on the agenda and uh he, he's also in talks if if um you know his snyder cut of justice league 1 does well he's going to be not only doing justice league 2 but also a man of steel 2 So this is what's currently on the board for the DCU. And I personally would love, love, love to see Zack Snyder's vision fully realized. I would love to see him finish. If they're going to disassemble the DCU, fine. But I want to see Zack Zack Snyder's 
story come to an end. I want to see the Injustice film that he was slowly leading towards. What are your thoughts, though? Is that something you'd be interested in? I would be interested in seeing a Man of Steel 2 for sure. I love Henry Cavill's Superman, but what uh, about you? Uh, not quite as much as you do. This is Rumor Street, not Disagreement Street. So uh, Okay, all right. Like well, I, I, I'll, go, I'll, I'll watch I'm, it. I'm just kidding. You, you know I'm me, I'll kidding. watch it. You know me, I'll watch it because it's DC and Marvel. But I more want to see the Justice League. And Captain Jim FTW, I want to go ahead and I'll answer your question here in a sec. But I want to go ahead and tell you, Josh, right now, I would see it. I'm more excited about the Justice League 2 part of it. Plus, it was leading to a battle. Again, as I say, almost every time we touch on the subject to a Hall of Villains versus Justice League, which would be the uber cool way to see that on screen. That would be just awesome. Hey, whether you make it in part two, or whether you make it a part three, I would love to see that right now. And Captain Jim FTW, we're going to touch on Cobra Kai as far as in 2021, season three, but season one and two was purchased by Netflix. I want to, I know you were asking questions that, and I appreciate your comments and questions in the uh, YouTube page right now. So thank you so much for watching us while we're talking about more stuff. So Josh, does that answer your question on, on as far as uh, Justice League is concerned? Yeah, man. And you know, man of steel is cool, but I really want to see Justice League two uh, better, especially the way it was leading to, you know, the way Zack Snyder was filming it at that point in time. Yeah. So from my understanding of Justice League, Parts one and two is supposed to be like Avengers Infinity War and Endgame. So one film leads into another. There was maybe supposed to be, you know, Ben Affleck's Batman was supposed to go in between as as well as Man of Steel 2. So my hope here would be that we will get to see that come to come to like I would love in Snyder's Justice League if he completely rewrote the way the film ended so that we end up don't just get that fight with Steppenwolf. We get the lead up towards Darkseid. That would be great. But, you know, at this point, nobody really knows anything beyond that, beyond the fact that's going to be a four part series. But, you know, th- that that would be my ultimate wish. Season one and two are coming today to Netflix. Thank you for the update on that. Uh, I'm excited for it. And if you can check out Cobra Kai on Netflix. But yes, that's so, definitely something you want to go ahead and, and tune into. I called season one one of the best shows of the year. In fact, someone else that's watching, Jessica Box from the TV Ratings Guide.com, but you don't know the time. I'm not sure what time it's going to debut, especially for Netflix in Europe, and I do apologize for that. But, you know, we are going to go ahead and keep you updated on, you know, season three because there were some announcements that Cobra Kai made, not only with season three coming in 2021, but something else that was added. But I know, like you said, season one and two are coming just around the corner on Netflix. So I know a lot of people are excited about that. But yes, season one, especially Captain Jim, if you have not seen it yet, season one is one of the best shows of the year it came out. But Josh, yeah, I mean, DCEU, the DC Extended Universe is something that, you know, it needs to extend. There needs to be a reason because like it's been talked about, everything is in its own bubble. And it needs to culminate into something special between all these parties. Yeah, I agree. I just want to see Snyder's vision become complete because I have a feeling that despite, you know, the the bad stops on the way there, like there, it could could have ended in something great because he actually, unlike Brian Singer, who had never read an X-Men comic before making that movie, like Zack Snyder is a legitimate comic book fan. So I would have I would love to see his his story come to fruition. What else do you have on a plate for our road down the Rumorville? That is uh, actually it right now. I was It's a short road around. then. I've been digging around for some stuff on Nintendo, but I mean, there's no like, right, there's no new rumors on any of those Mario remakes or any of that. So right now it's all, it's all kind of up in the air. Well, I will tell you, there are wild rumors of the pre-orders going up very, very soon for PlayStation 5. They're actually already soliciting people out there. If you want to go ahead and are interested in doing a pre-order on the PlayStation 5, Sony says, please get to their website as soon as possible so you can be on that list to go ahead and be one of the first to order it. So we will go ahead and touch on Cobra Kai right now. Cobra Kai is coming out season 3, 2021. 
Netflix is about ready to drop seasons one and two onto the Netflix streaming platform, which, again, if you've not seen it, you need to go out of your way to see it. Season one, especially. It is so good. I will say this, that on top of that message, it's kind of weird timing because the the video game company should have gotten the heads up on it. There's going to be a Cobra Kai beat-em-up game coming in October. So I want to hear your thoughts, Josh, before we touch on a, another question that Captain Jim F, FTW has. I want to ask you a question. Would you be excited to play a Cobra Kai video game? Um, It depends on what it's like. What does it look like? Like, I, I imagine Cobra Kai would be a fun game to play, like, in the style of Streets of Rage. You know, nothing with, like, really fancy over-the-top graphics, but maybe something that is the side-scrolling beat-em-ups of yesteryear. You know, you're kind of, like, walking along. You got that cool 80s music going. Your characters are in constant motion, whether it's moving their legs or their hips. And, they, you know, you throw you throw trash cans and punch and stuff, and you hear this, hoo, hoo, as they're fighting. That would be a game I could get behind. But I don't know if it, if it was, like, a 3D fighter. I don't know if I could would be interested in something like that. It feels like if you're going to make a game like that, it needs to be made for nostalgia. Uh, absolutely. But they did start off. I did see some of the images of it. It does have some of the the references from now, but it also has some of the references from the original Karate Kid movie with the bullies, like, obviously, who now is the hero of Cobra Kai. He's dressed. Remember that scene where they're beating, the bullies are beating up on Ralph Macchio's character in the uh, skeleton Halloween outfits and all that? I do, yes. Yeah, that's in the game. So uh, I know that's just one part of it. So it's it's kind of funny how that that's going to be laid out. But yes, I'm very intrigued by a Cobra Kai video game. Just would have been nice if they delayed that as well. But maybe it's obviously, for, I'm assuming it's for financial reasons why they're going to release it in October. But it'd be kind of cool if they had timed that out better. In fact, they were probably going to time it out when it was going to drop originally on Netflix this fall, but it looks like it's going to be, as far as the, the TV series, delayed to 2021, but the game itself is still on course for an October release. Black Widow will, at this point, we're going to see what happens because, you know, coming up in the next week is Mulan, and if Mulan makes a ton of cash on Disney+, Plus, that might change Disney's mindset on whether or not they have to release it in full to theaters. But then again, there's also the complexities now of some theaters opening back up, as we're seeing now with New Mutants that's going to be opening up this weekend. So it is a question that Disney will be pondering quite a bit over the next couple months before the scheduled November release for Black Widow. So I think right now I would still lean on the theater side, Josh, your thoughts on Black Widow? Because Captain Jim FTW was asking about that. Depends on if they're going to, you know, do like what they did with the Wonder Woman trailer and say only in theaters and big letters. But from what I understand, there's already been listings leaked onto some streaming sites about Black Widow. So I don't, I don't know if there's any validity to that or if they kind of just jumped the gun on it. But if Mulan is a success and people end up watching it or paying the thirty dollars for it, I can totally see them doing. Black Widow and Black Widow is actually it looks like a movie that would be better in theaters but it also like it feels like a prime experiment I guess for how Marvel films will do in people's living rooms uh, as opposed to going to the theaters and I know I I don't know if we're going to get to this but I know that the critics are actually like refusing to go to movie theaters so I don't even know if they were to put it out I guess November when it's supposed to come out if there would even be any critical reception for it or any reviews or anything like that. Well, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, it will come out to both theaters and somehow be VOD at the same time. I don't think I'm going to get my wish, but I know that Mulan coming next week to Disney plus, how many people are going to buy into that will dictate heavily on whether or not that black widow is going to follow out that same formula. You're listening to the Pop Culture Cosmos. For the latest news and information, analysis and opinions on the Los Angeles Lakers and the NBA, check out the Lakers Fast Break podcast today on wherever you get your podcasts. But again, we've got a lot of things to talk about on today's program. Thank you so much, Jessica Boggs, and also Captain Jim FTW as well. Cannot thank you both for watching again. Want to thank everybody for listening. It's the Pop Culture Cosmos. 
our good friends in Belarus. I know you're going through a lot right now, but thank you so much for making us the number one entertainment news show in your country on Apple Podcasts. We just truly appreciate it. Coming up, we're going to be talking about Call of Duty Cold War. We're going to be talking about some of the Gamescom quick highlights. We're going to be talking about New Mutants versus Bill and Ted. I'm going to have a review uh, or at least some thoughts that I, I, because I recently saw Dollhouse, the eradication of female subjectivity from American popular culture. We're going to talk about DC's fandom. And we're also going to be talking about Madden 21 coming up in the show. But first, my friend, it is Gamescom. Some quick highlights because it did start off earlier today with your friend and mine, Jeff Keighley. New Ratchet and Clank footage. Some Star Wars squadrons. They they showed the campaign portion of it, a little bit of that. 12 Minutes debuted its cast, which is a high-powered cast for such an indie game. It's a very intriguing time loop type of top-down game. Very interesting indie game. Could win win the hearts of a lot of people out there. And anytime you're able to go ahead and get Willem Dafoe, Daisy Ridley, and James McAvoy on your cast, that's pretty good for that for that game. Medal of Honor is going VR with a new VR game coming later this year. Lego Star Wars with the Skywalker Saga, which you knew was probably going to be inevitable because you know the, the developers of the Lego Star Wars series want to go ahead and get every single dollar they can out of the series before it goes dark for the next couple of years. DLC is coming for Doom Eternal, Destiny 2, and more. And, of course, the second season of Fall Guys, the independent hit, which is just a breakout hit for, for them. And I'm so happy for Devolver Digital and the fact that this really cool slash party game slash battle royale game slash really cool thing to, to observe and cute game and all in one, that's coming out with their second season in October. So I want to hear, hear your thoughts, my friend. Nothing overwhelmingly just, you know, earth-shattering this time around for Gamescom, but I want to hear your thoughts on if anything that is is really speaking out to you as far as the early announcements from Gamescom. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm really actually glad to see Medal of Honor making a comeback. I didn't think that we'd ever get any more games by them. They showed the trailer for Fall Guys Season 2. I guess yes. a lot of people are excited about that. Other than that, like I saw the thing for Little Nightmares too. Actually, pretty excited about that. I really enjoyed the first one, but I'm gonna have to get back to you because I need to sit down and actually watch some of these. There are uh, quite a few games that I have never actually heard of before, so that would be, um, you know, that's something I'm definitely I'm always interested in some new IPs, and I'm it, I'm assuming that this isn't just like them going around trying to get whatever trailers they can from whoever will give them to them. I'm hoping that this is actually like. These are games that I could get excited about. Anything that stuck out to you? Actually, right now, yes. 12 minutes. Uh, It's an interesting top-down type of uh, time loop game. It goes into very aspects of time. It looks like it's a couple sharing a dinner or an anniversary, and somebody breaks in, and uh, depending on the decisions you make, it can go one way or the other as far as either coming out okay or ending up in death. So it's it's really quite interesting. And, of course, like I said, it has an all-star cast of Willem Dafoe, Daisy Ridley, and James McAvoy. So anytime you start off right there, it, that's really cool. So that's something I think you should take a look at. It's a very interesting top-down perspective. So I, I think I'm liking that one the most. And, of course, Star Wars Squadrons came out, again, with a nice little campaign trailer, which leads me to a bigger question in regards to this. Star Wars Squadrons looks really good. Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order looks really good. Why can't you just combine both into one superlative game that combines all those elements and just really nails both ends of it? Are we Wait, are we talking about a game, or are we talking Star, about... Star Wars, Star Wars Squadrons. Take... Star Wars Squadrons game. Yeah. I mean, you, you'd see all well, the, the flight aspects of it and the space flights and the, mm-hmm. and the dog fights. You've seen it already. I know you've seen the footage from E3 and all that. They came out with a campaign portion of it, but I'm talking about playing through a campaign that has elements of that and elements of where you're on a planet, where you're fighting, or whether you're exploring, whatever you're doing, similar to what we've seen from the successful hit Star Wars Je- Jedi Fallen Order, which you love so much. Why can't we have a game that combines elements of both and just really just nails it? So I, that's a great question, actually. I, I, if, if you were to ask me, 
I would say it's a money thing. I would I would tell you like look at the campaign for Jedi Fallen Order. That took me probably about uh, 15 12 to 15 hours to play through. The campaign on Battlefront 2 from what I understand was only like 4 hours. I'm betting Squadron's going to be anywhere from 5 to 6 hours if that. I mean those game those flight sim games are usually a lot shorter than that. So if you were to ask me why, I would say that it's money. Like Star Wars is a very, and you know, we're thinking this is EA that's making this game. So Star Wars is one of those properties where they, I'm pretty sure that, if, and when it comes to making money off of it, they want to make a bunch of smaller games and may and sell them at sixty dollars a piece, as opposed to making a big Mass Effect type game where you can get in the ship and fly places, go fight, and have that big old story. I, I I know that fans would absolutely love to have something like that, but I don't think that EA is uh, is unselfish enough to make it. If that is making sense, I just would be awesome if we could have uh, you know that type of Star Wars experience to get people excited about the Star Wars IP. I mean, Jedi Fallen Order did it very well and knocked it out of the park in many aspects as far as the ground combat is concerned. You absolutely loved it. And they nailed that portion of it. Star Wars Squadrons looks really, really good. And it's at a reduced price, which everybody seems to like. Everybody's concerned about the length of the game. So we'll have to wait and see how that is. But again, I just would like to see for $60 or maybe two, three years from now when we're paying $70 for games because it's on the PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X, just a combination of both those elements into one full game. I know it's been tried before. I know it's been attempted before. I just haven't seen it executed right now. But I'd love to see EA go with something like that as an adventure as long as they have the Star Wars IP. Yeah, I would absolutely love to see something like that. I just don't see them doing it. You know, I just I don't see them wanting to put the uh, wanting to lose the chance to make a bunch of money off of a bunch of separate titles. That's just how they operate. So, uh, I mean, one one could only hope because that if they created a Star Wars IP that was truly immersive, took you to all these planets, it, uh, it immersed you into Star Wars lore. Yeah, I think they could bring back a lot of angry people or a lot of people that they pushed away with their their latest Star Wars films. They could bring that culture back. Like that's what I was wondering too. Like, you know, you have Fallen Order. And that the storytelling in that game is absolutely amazing. So I look at the movies. Why can't that be translated into the films? And, you know, I've talked to a lot of people about this. And a lot of people are under the impression it's Kathleen Kennedy's fault. Other people are under the impression it's the studio's fault. Other people say it's a product of society and times and yada yada. But there's just there is still magic to be born from the Star Wars universe. It's just not being executed right it's not being they're not making movies for the right reasons anymore well we'll have to wait and see about star wars squadrons but it does look pretty good right now i am very impressed by it Uh, there was also some great ratchet and clank ripped apart footage the playstation 5 it looks pretty good is it earth shattering Uh, next generation Uh, wow i'm doing backflips no it's not Although at this point in time, it's probably real, be real hard for me to do backflips, but that's beside the point. It's just going to be wait and see with, with both those games. Jessica Boggs is weighing in that she thinks a lot of people can be brought back with the right ingredients. Yeah, a lot of people can be brought back with the Star Wars universe if a lot of things go right here in two, three, most likely three years down the line when the new Star Wars movies comes out. But it's going to take a lot of effort. It's going to take definitely a lot of effort for everybody at Lucasfilm to go ahead and get people excited about it because you see the diminishing returns yeah. already. I do. And like my my thoughts on that is that, again, they're not making movies for the right reasons. Like we're living in this era where every scene needs to cater to a group or needs to sell a T-shirt or needs to sell action figures or it needs to help open up a something at Disneyland. Star Wars, the original trilogy, what made that so magical is that they that was made back during a time when people watched and made movies be just because of the magic that it brought to their lives. And that's not something that happens anymore. That's something that it's not just existing in the DC or in the Star Wars universe, but we've also seen this happen in the DC universe. 
But yes, they can bring people back, but they need to go back to that idea that Star Wars is meant to like just take you to another world and be something magical for everybody and not it's just something meant to to sell merchandise. And that's the thing. It's it needs to have something that people can really latch on to once again. Am I expecting any type of Star Wars uh, revival to the extent what we saw in 1977 and 1980? No. But still, it can be one of the most, if not the most, popular movie IP still out there if with the right things. If, if, if things fall back their way once again and, and the storytelling becomes something that you and I both can, and also millions of fans out there can be really excited about once again. Because right now, Star Wars is on a low... I don't want to say it's at the lowest point because obviously The Mandalorian has been a great hit and some other things in the Star Wars universe like you talked about with Jedi Fallen Order, but it's at a low point and almost at its lowest, probably after the... But would you say it's at a, it was at its lowest point with the the prequels? Maybe? I, I, don't, I don't know if the... I mean... Yes, the prequels weren't as well received, but I they had elements of things that you could enjoy, whereas this one was just plain old frustrating. You know, and you're you're saying Mandalorian, you're saying Jedi Fallen Order. Jedi Fallen Order came out literally three weeks before the the last movie was released, and then Mandalorian came out after the movie was released. So without those things, Star Wars would really be just at the bottom of the ladder, you know, and they could only go up from there. So it, it's yeah, I mean there there is still magic to be had from this series, but it just it needs to be made for the right reasons. That it does, my friend. But there was a lot of interesting things shown off at the early sneak peek preview at Gamescom with your friend and mine, Jeff Keeley. Uh, I I like the fact that Medal of Honor is getting some love once again, uh, even though it's going VR. Fall Guys, the independent hit is just coming out with a second season in October, so a lot of people are looking forward to that. And of course, what started off was Call of Duty Cold War footage. So I want to ask you this, my friend. Did you? I, I'm not sure if you got a chance to check out the trailer yesterday for Call of Duty Cold War, but can I go ahead and spoil a little bit for you? I'm the world's number one Call of Duty fan. I, I don't think this is something I could ever walk away from if you spoil it for me. I just I will never play another Call of Duty game ever again. So Well, you said Call of Duty Cold War last week was something that uh, you could get back interested in. Yeah, I'm just kidding, man. Yeah, you can spoil okay, it away. Fair I enough, really fair enough. Well, I, I just thought it's it was no, really it's, cool. It's no Halo or Mass Effect. No, no, it isn't. But when you have the cutscenes that they showed off there and the fact that Ronald Reagan is involved with it to make that Cold War feeling even more 1980s-ish as far as the missions that you have to go on, whether it's near the KGB headquarters or whether, you know, what parts of Eastern Europe or wherever the game will take you. It's very interesting to get his likeness involved in there and him as involved as a character kind of helping to orchestrate all the what's going on within the confines of the game. I just thought it was kind of an interesting aspect about it. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can't have Cold War or a timeline without Ronald Reagan. I'm wondering if he'll be voiced or if he'll it's it'd be cool if you had like a. OK, well, then it'd be cool if you had like a moment where like you're in the game interacting with him or even like playing as him. That'd be interesting. But OK, so I'll give Call of Duty this. I'll give them the fact that like this could be good for people. A lot of people don't know anything about history. They're like, you know, a nice like little history lesson. This would be this could be good for people. And Mikhail Gorbachev, I would like. I'm, I'm assuming if they got Reagan, they might have him as an appear in the game as well. So it'll be interesting to see what kind of take Call of Duty has on the Cold War when Call of Duty Cold War comes out. Well, I should say Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War. Man, you got to get rid of the Black Ops part because Call of Duty Cold War that is like rolls off the tongue a lot better. But yes, it's coming out. I believe November thirteenth. So it's a little bit later. For Call of Duty this year, but yes, it's Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War coming November 13th. Well, we got a lot more to talk about in the back half of the hour, including New Mutants versus Bill and Ted. I have a review of Dollhouse. DC has a big decision to make about the future of its fandom, and Man 21 hits this weekend. So we're going to talk about all those things and more coming up after the break. This is the PCC Multiverse. Coming soon, Zero Cool Films presents 
action figure adventure. Super collector Jay Bartlett hits the road once again in search of action figures, most iconic and noteworthy and rare figures, all in the name of creating the most ultimate action figure auction ever. He fronts the cash that charity benefits in the end. What will he get? How will he get it? And how well will he do? Find out November 1st, 2020. And we're back at the program. It's the PC Multiverse. My friend, I don't know if I want to call this a big movie weekend, but in essence, it's a big movie weekend because we have New Mutants coming to theaters. We have Bill and Ted, for the most part, bypassing theaters and going straight to video on demand, or they're trying to do something where it's a hybrid of both. And then you have Tenet. Sneak peeks of Tenet starting out to being filtered out to theaters this weekend. So I guess, in essence, it's the most important box office weekend of the year. Could you say that? Even though it won't be the highest grossing anywhere near it, it just still possibly will end up being the most important box office weekend of the year. Most important or only, I guess you could choose your words wisely there. It's um, difficult to say how it, to express that. But, you know, it, it's the biggest yeah, one in a long yeah. time. At least six months. Yeah. Uh, so this one's this one's a little weird. You know, I was talking about this earlier. Uh, I've been kind of following a lot of the articles about these movies coming out, and I know Bill and Ted is getting sporadically released, New Mutants sporadically released. I don't know how I feel about this. I feel like there, this is kind of uh, you would rate this as like a first world problem, but like reviewers are getting mad that Disney, especially, is not creating a safe environment for them to view the movie in and it that's there's a boycott because of it if it's coming to vod services is new mutants going to be something you can watch via your living room not right away only bill and ted has said has embraced the vod okay so i mean i don't know how i feel about this like i feel like this is good because I don't like critics, but I also feel like, you know, New Mutants is has is a movie that has overcome so much just to get where it is today. And, you know, you're doing it, it a disservice by not letting critics view it ahead of time. I mean, if anything, just send them like a one of those for your consideration copies. But it, it's it's really a weird thing. You know, it's a, it's a very weird thing. And. I honestly, on the other hand, I think that critics should go pay to see movies. They should. And, and here's the thing, too. Like, nobody's going to be in these theaters. So I don't know exactly what they're complaining about. It's all, I don't know. My thoughts are all over the place on this. I I want New Mutants to do well just because it's suffered so much. I, I'm going to see Tenant regardless of what the critics say. I also don't like crit, the uh, film critics. So I'm all over the place on this. What are your thoughts? Well, I still... I'm not as harsh on the critics as you are as someone who, like you, reviews films from time to time, and we share our thoughts on it. So in essence, we're a small way. We're kind of film and movie critics ourselves, which I will explain here later in the hour when I review a film. Uh, so I want to ask... Well, uh, I like to think that, yes, we do critique films, but we're not... We don't tear apart the people that made them. And I think that's what separates us from those film critics. Okay. Okay. So, cause you might hopefully can, we'll continue that thought process as I go ahead and I, I share my review coming up here in a little bit, but it is going to be an important weekend. I'm personally thinking that people are going to have to make a choice whether they want to stay in and watch Bill and Ted or whether they want to go out and watch new mutants or People are actually really excited to go out and venture out there. We saw Tom Cruise venturing out there already to catch sneak peeks of Tenet. So I want to hear your thoughts on that because people, of the three films, people seem to be excited about Tenet the most. Yeah, I think Tenet looks looks great. Like I would like to venture out to the theater to watch Tenet. I, was all, I would also like to see New Mutants. Just because I can watch it from my living room, I will probably watch Bill and Ted you know, at, at some point, either this weekend or next week, but Air guitar. I, uh, yeah, Tenet is definitely something that I would, as much as I hate to say this, I would suck my own oxygen through my mask for two hours to watch that movie. But I don't know, man. Like, I think that people are eventually going to like, if there's a movie and people are desperate enough to see it, yeah, they'll go out to the theaters to watch it. I don't know if these production companies should necessarily be responsible for creating 
safe spaces for reviewers, but I think that people are eventually going to want to go back to the movies, but it could be a long time before we see what we saw before. Oh yeah, it's going to be a long time before you know people in in fold in mass in a hundred percent what it used to be. I mean, I understand the movie industry as far as people attending was going down anyways. I think about five to ten percent from the year year over year, so it wasn't heading in the right direction anyways. But still, there were millions of people going to the theaters. And I understand even the questions that we got earlier, like from Captain Jim FTW, that you know, was asking about if he was thinking he was going to be on theater or Disney+. Plus. And that question will continually come up as long as we're in the environment that we're in. And until we get to a point where there's a year or two buffer between what's going on now and a safer point in time, there's going to be people apprehensive about taking themselves or their family to the theaters. I understand that, you know, and here's the thing, though, like I'm out in Texas here and like there's a lot of people who just straight up don't care about COVID anymore. So, I mean, if I went to go see a movie here, chances are there would probably be, you know, a few people in the theater. But, you know, you go to someplace like California, the demographics different. So it's probably going to be close to nobody in the theater. So I guess it all depends on where you are. But yeah, it's going to be a while before we see like packed out theaters like we did before. There's going to be it's going to be a long time before, uh, you know, your people are going to go as groups to see midnight premieres or whatever it might be. It's just I think that culture could possibly be gone for for the rest of, you know, just for the foreseeable future. I think you're absolutely right. So it is going to come to the point where this weekend a lot of people are going to be making choices for the first time in a long time, really whether you want to go ahead and check out New Mutants or Bill and Ted at home or take a shot of T- at Tenet. So I want to hear your thoughts out there on if you're going to do any of those three. Are you going to go ahead and check out a sneak peek of Tenet? Are you going to go ahead and check out maybe New Mutants at the theaters? Or are you going to stay home and watch Bill and Ted face the music? Let us know your thoughts, popculturecosmos at yahoo.com. Also, as well, Pop Culture Cosmos, Humanica Media, and Game Source on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. Well, I, I did get a chance this past week to check out a movie that was sent over to me. It was called Dollhouse The Eradication of Female Subjectivity from American Popular Culture. A lot of people are referencing it as Dollhouse. It's available on various VOD platforms, including Amazon. I had a chance to Can check. Can you repeat it. the title again? Dollhouse. I'm sorry. No, I, I'm Dollhouse. The eradication of female subjectivity from American popular culture. I have the review up, and it's now available at popculturecosmos.com. I want to go ahead and and just give a shout out to the director uh, Nicole Brending because she did something as far as making a movie with a very, very, very strong message about the media's exploitation, and also our culture, our society, the way we exploit those that reach a level of success and then have a fall from grace. We've seen so many times before with any number of individuals, primarily female, which is obviously, you know, it's just very important to her, thus the name of the title. And that comes across extremely well in the film. I mean, you cannot avoid it. You cannot say, oh, I didn't get the message. Oh, I didn't check it out. I didn't understand it. Oh, I must have missed it. You can't say that because the message gets repeated over and over and over. Do you remember Team America World Police by Trey Parker and Matt Stone? Yes. Do you remember how they used the dolls? How they used the dolls? You know, the dolls were... Yeah, 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 yes, yes. This This was done in the same fashion. It was using dolls to tell its story and its narrative about a you know, fictionalized star who rises very quickly and then falls from grace even quicker. And it's just to the point where, I, you know, I, that part of it, there are parts of it that are really well told, but for the most part, it's just so heavy-handed with all these other things because it tried to combine so many stories of so many falls from graces at the same time that it becomes very convoluted but the but the actual message behind it still stays throughout so i thought the movie was like i said watchable but to the point where i can highly recommend it i can't but it is something if you really want to go ahead and better understand 
late 20th century and and obviously this century, 21st century, about how the media and our culture as a whole can go ahead and totally destroy someone's life that that go or actually build someone up and then tear them down. Go ahead and check out Dollhouse: The Eradication of Female Subjectivity from American Popular Culture. I know that's a lot of words there, but if you just type in Dollhouse 2020, that should come up as far as that's concerned. I know there's a couple other movies around that same name, but yeah, Dollhouse. Just look for the movie that has, uh, I guess, that uses dolls. For instance, it's a very crass movie. It's a very profane movie. It's a very adult-oriented movie. I mean, it makes Team America World Police look like a PG movie at times. So if you're, you know, you can handle the subject matter that it touches upon. Again, it's a very strong message indeed. I don't want to dissuade that from that. Or I don't want to detract from that. But the th- the way it was handled, I would have liked to have seen it handled better. But if you want to check out my full thoughts on it, uh, it's available now at popculturecosmos.com. If you want to go ahead and take a look at it. Again, it's uh, Dollhouse. Here we go. Dollhouse, The Eradication of Female Subjectivity from American Popular Culture. It's available now on Amazon, In Demand, Flix Fling, Fandango, Voodoo, and Video On Demand. My score's there. My thoughts in full are there. So you want to check it out. It's at popculturecosmos.com. You're listening to the Pop Culture Cosmos. Don't touch that dial. Wait, do, do people still use dials? If you need your video game fix, be sure to check out Retro City Games. Located in Town Square on Las Vegas Boulevard or in Henderson, Nevada, Retro City Games has the cure for all your video game vices. Retro games and games for current consoles, Nintendo, Sega, PlayStation, Xbox, and more. Retro City Games has all the staples from any library and some highly collectible offerings too. So pick up a few games today at Retro City Games in Town Square on Las Vegas Boulevard or in Henderson, Nevada. Retro City Games is your video game metropolis. All right, my friend. A lot more to talk about on today's program before we head on out, and that is DC. They did their fandom thing over the course of the weekend. 22 million views in 24 hours. That's a lot of views, my friend, isn't it? That is quite a few views, and... That's, I don't know, I mean, that seems like, yeah, that's a lot more people than would be able to attend Comic-Con. Yep, quite a few. So I ask you this, my friend, because a lot of those panels, which would normally have been closed to consumers, regular consumers that couldn't be able to access SDCC, like us that have been trying for so many years, I just want to ask this, it makes it more accessible to a wider audience. And isn't that the goal when you're going ahead and trying to promote upcoming projects, upcoming TV shows, upcoming films? I know DC is going to have something in the middle of next month that's going to add on to this as far as a second additional fandom with focusing on a lot of the TV shows and, and other projects like that. But I want to ask you this, with 22 million views in 24 hours... Do you think they should go back to San Diego Comic-Con? Because I'm thinking I wouldn't because, or at least be there in a minimal support because again, it's all about getting your products viewed by the largest amount of people. And this created an excitement for DC products like no other. Yeah. Well, I feel like the exclusivity of going to comic, like going to Comic-Con, the experience is really cool, but just because they're so it, the the number of tickets you can get are so limited and half of them go to like people who aren't even real comic book fans are just there for quote unquote the experience. I think that that kind of puts a sour taste in a lot of people's mouth. I know when I could, you know, I woke up late one morning and was unable to get tickets one year for Comic-Con and I just, I didn't really care to know anything about what was going on at Comic-Con. So yes, I think that having it online is a great idea. It makes it more accessible it makes it creates a community like you look at the comment boards people are able to talk about this stuff together you know it doesn't yeah i think that the experience of going and dressing up as your favorite hero being able to buy comic books is really cool but i don't know i think having it online creates a better community than going there in person i think it does and i think it's something that dc and warner brothers seriously needs to think about now that they have not only what they need to do with films out there and obviously bring it to the metroplexes and cinemas out there whenever they get that back and up and running, but you also have the major platform you want to try and push in HBO Max, which I think 
I, I think it brings a new dynamic into this. And the thing is, you can still continue the panels and, and whatnot at SDCC and and get some good coverage out there, but it sure doesn't beat the 22 million views or the 22 million people that you can potentially, or even more that you could reach out to and actually get people to watch your projects, your products, your television shows, your films that will be coming to not only the theaters, but again, video on demand, but most importantly, HBO Max, because all these projects will eventually wind up going there. So I think as an advertisement for HBO Max as an overarching theme, because you know me, I'm all about overarching themes when it comes to DC. I think that the fandom is going to be the way for them to go going forward. Yeah, I agree, man. It, it, this is the way to do it. This is, the, and, and just look at like the, the reception that it's gotten, right? It, it's, it's brought people together who can't afford to go to conventions or, or are too far away from California to be able to go like this is, this is you're able to really isolate so you're not just you know missing out on people being there because people are there to see things that aren't you like dc really cre- everyone who loves dc was able to participate in this and i think that this was this was a really great idea and it was something that again creates a big community around dc products and it created a lot of hype i personally am very excited about a lot of the dc stuff and i love that i was able to watch it without having those like behind closed door trailers. Absolutely. And that's the thing, because we were always having to what search out for those cell phone videos and those like tilted sideways. And we're just looking at it like, yeah, yeah, I think I saw Superman's black suit. You know, oh man, it looks so cool. Like it it was kind of fuzzy though, because I couldn't really see it. So in this case, it works out a lot better now because people are just able to go ahead. It's out there. And people are just able to go ahead and see everything that's going on when it comes to the DC fandom. Got another comment that came in with Jessica Boggs, virtual conventions. Well, you're seeing it now. New York Comic Con, all of them are going to have a virtual convention in some form or fashion, at least for this year, Jessica. We're seeing all of them do that. Uh, CES is going to have a virtual convention early next year. They're not going to have something physical for the first time in seemingly forever. I mean, this is someone who here who has attended CES since 1996. So I am kind of bummed, but I wouldn't have gone to it anyways had it you know, become a live event one more time. So they're going to try and do something virtual. Every convention for the foreseeable future, at least for the next, what, six to eight, nine months are going to go virtual in some form or fashion. That's the way they're getting viewers. That's the way they're gaining interest. That's the way they're they're able to go ahead and at least salvage some of the money that that they would normally be getting because they're all taking a big loss because they get a lot of money from housing those different vendors, those different studios when they go in and, and those different manufacturers and makers and whatever when they have them go ahead and open up those booths. I mean, they're renting those booths out. There's, there's all those spaces and to a lot of people, and what we were talking about before with the con guys, the con guys mentioned the vendors that make a lot of money that, you know, it's, it's right now, it's a very difficult time. And the way these comic cons can only make money at this point in time is through virtual. So I, I see it now happening for quite some time, at least until what, maybe, maybe February, March at the earliest. But even still, I feel like it's a good idea to keep these things going or at least have their own convention and still broadcast online at the same time. Like, I don't think there's any need for DC to go back to Comic-Con just showing how successful this was. And that's one of the things I wanted to ask you is now that we see DC doing this with its fandom and no D23 this year, When do you think Marvel might go ahead and start doing this for real? I mean, Marvel may actually just integrate its brand and doing something like this, integrate it into a D23 next year. But do you see Marvel doing something on its own? Do you see them sticking with SDCC? I see them doing something on its own because they just saw how successful it can be. But you think DC, 22 million, people might even go 30 or 40 million with a Marvel fandom type deal. Well, what we all know about Disney is that they love money. So 
yeah, I, th- I think that they would encourage or create a separate event for Marvel and uh, just charge more money to get into it. So, yes, I totally see them doing this. Um, D23 is already taken over a, a largely by Disney properties and Star Wars. I think that it would be a good idea for Marvel to have their own thing just because Marvel is such a big thing, you know, and it, there, there's so much in terms of comic books and I don't know if they'll ever go back to animated films, but you know, and and feature films and stuff like that. So yes, I think it'd be very beneficial of Marvel to have their own fan event, especially like the right now, like seeing what happened with DC, I am far more stoked about DC stuff than I am Marvel stuff just because I, I love so much what they did. And I love the transparency that they showed during this event. But that's the thing when it comes to Marvel doing something like this, you mentioned Star Wars and D23. Star Wars, remember, in what is it, usually around April-ish or whatnot, they do the thing, was it in Chicago? They do the Star Wars celebration. So they already have their own celebration, which they could easily transition into a virtual conference type deal. Then you have D23, but you could still have on the side a Marvel thing as well. So I, you're, you're right. When it comes down to it, Disney loves its money. But this is a great way to go ahead and promote your platform even more so than what San Diego Comic-Con has offered. And this goes back to what we talked about originally over the years with E3. As these larger companies start to branch off into doing their own thing and break away from the, the overall narrative, which is E3. As much as I loved E3 and I loved these companies doing E3, it's obviously more advantageous for them to go ahead and despite the fact that, that the most press covers the E3, it's it's obviously advantageous for them to do their own thing. And when it comes to Marvel and DC, it's becoming more and more obvious that they need to go ahead and do their own thing as well, which will only hurt San Diego Comic-Con even more. Yeah, so it's very possible like Comic-Con could just become some kind of like workshop, but I, I don't see... DC and Marvel sticking around. And I wonder how long before like Vertigo and Dark Horse and IDW follow suit. That's, that's the thing. And then all these other smaller productions or television shows or anybody that loved to go ahead and be part of Comic-Con that we saw, or these, even these films, that's the thing. There's always going to be these films like, let's for instance, say Bill and Ted's face the music, which did a panel at Comic-Con. It was one of the more notable panels at comic-con you know there's still going to be a need to be a platform for all these other smaller entities to go ahead and come together in some form or fashion to build a larger platform so san diego comic-con will still have possibly a use for being just that but it still will not make as much of a dent as say a marvel weekend or a dc fandom that could just really rock the socks off the pop culture world I agree, but I also wonder, like, the smaller companies, maybe they'll put together their own thing, you know, maybe they'll find smaller conventions to kind of become flagships at. It's hard to say for sure, but its future is questionable, that's for sure. The future of San Diego Comic-Con is questionable, and hopefully we'll get a clearer idea before San Diego Comic-Con hits next July, and we'll see what happens. What are your thoughts out there on DC's Fandom? Did you get a chance to check it out? And do you think it's going to be the wave of the future as far as DC and Marvel branching off of their appearances at San Diego Comic-Con to do their own thing? Share us your thoughts, popculturecosmos at yahoo.com. Well, my friend, it's been a great episode, but before we head on out, your favorite game is coming out this weekend, and no, it's not PGA Tour 21. Although that is coming out if you're a golfing fan. It is Madden 21. So I want to hear your thoughts on still one of the most popular video games that's out there on the market each and every year. But what I want to hear your thoughts on is the Madden influence at this point in time in a pandemic. Because with football around the corner, I want to hear your thoughts on Madden NFL 21 coming out this weekend I know a lot of gamers are looking forward to it. It is one of the most popular video games out there, but I want to ask your thoughts on Madden NFL 21 before we head on out. So it's very maddening. Um, Uh (laughs) uh, Yeah, it is what it is. I guess it, it is important. I wonder if it's going to reflect the 
happenings going on here with uh you know covid are we going to see like no people in the stands are they going to take recordings from other sports games and put it into this so they don't just make new sports noises assuming the season's going to happen so like if covid happens and the season gets shut down is Madden season going to get shut down? They're going to be like, sorry, you got to go back and play Madden 20. There's just a lot of questions here that I want answered. Well, first of all, the irony of piped in video game noise into a video game from another video game would be absolutely insane. Although that's the kind of a, outside of a developmental nightmare, a copyright nightmare, that would still actually be kind of very unique and novel. But anyway, it's getting back to the actual game itself. No, I think the season will go on in Madden NFL 21. I think you'd be kidding yourself if Electronic Arts is just going to stop because the real-life season stops, which is a very possible, likely outcome if people start to get sick out there on the field and they, they start to go ahead and one player gets the rest of his teammates or other people on the other team. There's a lot of semantics when it comes to what's going on in real life, but Madden 21 is still going to be the same. There's still going to be the competitions. There's still going to be the esports. There's still going to be the challenges. There's still going to be the full crowds, I would imagine. Although may, you may actually get the option to turn turn the crowds off. So we'll wait and see on that. But it is Madden NFL 21. Yes, Josh Peterson, according to the comments provided by Josh Peterson, Josh is hilarious. So we'll have to wait and see what Madden NFL 21 is up to. But it is... Without a doubt, one of the notable video game releases of the year. You know, all kidding aside, my friend, Madden and the history behind it. You know, I was watching it on the High Score docuseries that's available on Netflix about the importance of Madden and where it stands. So I want to hear your thoughts as we go out on Madden's importance to the video game industry. Madden is a very tyrannical property. They they bought out the rights to Fever. They brought out the rights to Blitz. They they kind of put all the other football games out of business. So you have no choice but to play Madden. And it's just the same thing over and over again. So it's something that I would never play myself. But again, I know there are people out there who like it. But Madden, regardless, year in, year out, is a still extremely solid performer. It's still in the top 10 each and every year. I don't want to dissuade people from that. You guys and gals that are interested in Madden 21, check it out this weekend. It's it's available. It's going to be out on the streets as you hear this podcast. So if you get a chance, check out Madden. And uh, you know what? Hopefully it will give you your football fix because we don't know what's going on 100% with the future of the NFL this season. It could play out like the NBA is most likely going to do, at least now as I say this. But there's a good chance that it could also be canceled at any point in time. So I hope there's a separate mechanic where like you have to sanitize yourself after each game. Like, you know, there's a little mini game, you know how in um, fight night they used to have the thing where you had to like rub the scrubber over your boxer's face. Like, I hope they have that, but with like hand sanitizer and you have to scrub yourself after every game. That would be kind of cool. As I said before, Josh is hilarious thank you i'll be here all week want to go ahead and thank jessica boggs and also as well captain jim ftw for their comments if you have any comments for us please as always popculturecosmos at yahoo.com so josh it's been a great episode any last thoughts on the way out on the next episode, I think it is important that we talk about the lackluster Nintendo Switch Direct yesterday and how Nintendo is scaring me, frankly. You notice how I didn't even touch upon it on today's show. Yeah, and, and like Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles Remaster was like the biggest thing they released. And if I remember that game correctly, like you play co-op, but somebody has to carry a bucket around the whole game. So I don't know if that was really like a good flagship title to go out on, but... Nintendo's making me nervous. And the rumors of two Switches coming out next year. We can touch on that on Monday's episode, The Pop Culture Cosmos. Plus, as you know, always, we cover the latest news and trends in pop culture every week right here, The Pop Culture Cosmos. So for Josh Peterson, this is Gerald Glassford. It's another beautiful day in paradise right here in the PCC multiverse thank you for listening and here's hoping 
you have yourself a great